Okay. Next, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Eric Widman. Uh, Dr. Eric Widman is the Director of Product for Machine Learning at HelloFresh. Previously, he has built AI innovation teams at Accenture and consulted for Fortune 100 companies on a variety of products within the fields of computer vision, NLP, topic modeling, voice AI, classification, and forecasting. Before his work in AI, he spent 10 years in the biotech industry designing neurostimulators and image processing algorithms for ultrasound machines. Outside work, he enjoys spending time with his wife, Anna Me, and his 15-month-year-old son, Julian. He is also a musician in the band Love in October and is passionate about cooking and exercise science. Okay, Dr. Whitman, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen here and rearrange my windows. Give me a few seconds here. Move stuff around. Okay, uh, let's blow this up a little bit. <clears throat> So uh, welcome to today's talk. Uh, today we're going to talk about building an MLOps platform um, and how we've approached that at HelloFresh. Uh, before we get into it, Olivia gave me a very nice introduction so I can keep the slide short. Um, uh, I think the only thing that maybe she didn't mention here is that uh, I'm actually originally from Sweden. I've spent about half of my life there, uh, both in education and in work, and the other half in the U.S. And uh, my educational path, I've started in electrical engineering, like she mentioned, kind of on the hardware side, then moved over into the software space uh, during my PhD years and went into the AI space uh, from there. So, so I think that's the only thing that wasn't mentioned. So let's get into the talk. So this talk, it's not about promoting an MLOP service. It's not about telling you how to do MLOps or what the right way uh, to do MLOps is. It's uh, AI leadership talk. It's, it's about the why behind um, how do you make good decisions when building a platform system, when, bu when building an MLOps system. The tools aren't that important because the tools are rapidly changing and they're changing all the time. Um, but what is important is the frameworks for the decision-making and, and kind of the, how do you make intelligent intelligent decisions in this space. So really focus on the why, not the how or the what. And I'm gonna show you a lot of information here today. Um, and uh, this is the work of many, many people, uh, many talented people. And I wanna thank them for all their contributions. Uh, this is not a work of uh, Eric just producing all this content that you're about to see. So I wanna acknowledge that. This talk is really divided into three parts. Uh, first, we're going to kick things off with a quick primer on ML ops, just so uh, we all have, have a baseline understanding of what it is and why it's important. Then we're going to talk about HelloFresh in a section I call interesting things about HelloFresh. And then we're going to take the first two sections and combine them and talk about ML ops at HelloFresh. Um, the first two sections are going to go pretty quickly. Um, because the meat and potatoes is really in the third section here. And I want to make sure that we get to that so we have time to dive deep there. OK, so let's talk about ML Ops. Uh, this is just kind of skimming the surface to give you a quick taste of it. Uh, it's not really an in-depth um, uh, uh, education on ML Ops, so, uh, so be warned. I think a good way to think about ML Ops and understand why it's important is to frame this um, in the context of where most of us start as, as data scientists and ML practitioners. So I think when many of us have gotten started, we, we start off by collecting a data set online. Maybe we upload it to the cloud or, or locally to our computer. And we start working on a notebook. We explore the data. We do our feature transformation. We train our models. We evaluate the models against different metrics. Uh, finally, we, we feel like we have something that's given us pretty good results. and. Maybe we save the models, we save the inference results, and we're feeling we're feeling really good about it ourselves. We feel like we have nailed a sub segment of machine learning. Um, I think that's a great start. But um, machine learning and at a large company in a production environment looks very different. Um, what you know, quote the real world looks like is that in real life you'll have multiple data sources. You'll probably have a data lake, a data warehouse. You might have streaming data, um, you have data coming off of your 
product, website, or app, um, you'll have probably large amounts of data, you know, hundreds of millions of rows, many gigabytes, maybe terabytes of data. You're going to take all of that data and you're going to try to transform it and make it useful for your machine learning models. You're going to probably, instead of doing that right in your notebook, you'll probably do ETL as a service, uh, maybe using one of these services here. And you'll start training, uh, probably in practice, multiple models, probably not just one model, but you'll do multiple models, probably with distributed computing because you're managing uh, so much data and you want to move faster. Um, in the real world, you see a lot of situations where you have nested models, where a first set of models feed downstream models uh, or their input to downstream models. And eventually you are going to uh, serve those models either by batch or real time, and you wanna do some monitoring on them. So you can see that the real world looks much more complex and there's many more things that can go wrong here. Uh, everything from pipelines breaking, you have data sources that are changing. So you might have data quality issues. You have a lot of orchestration of infrastructure that needs to happen. You want to observe your model quality to, to make sure that your models don't drift and uh, you know that they're accurate and they're doing what you intended them to do. So there's, uh, and on top of all of that, you know, if we were to just do all of this manually, uh, this is a lot of work and your data science team can basically spend all their time in maintenance mode and never have the opportunity to um, to produce new models. So um, that's why we really want to try to automate things as much as possible, especially the deployment of new models. And <laughs> excuse me, I'm battling a cold here, so I'm going to be coughing a little bit throughout this presentation. If we, we zoom out and look at the goals of MLOps, I think they're threefold. The first is faster deployment of uh, retrained models into production. The second is faster experimentation and model development. We can often achieve that through sharing our features through a feature store across an organization. And the third is model and data quality assurance. So checking the uh, data quality at the source and checking the model quality uh, in production to make sure you don't have model drift. Uh, I'm going to show you two images here uh, just to kind of frame the problem a little bit more if, if you're new to ML ops. Um, here's a slide. Uh, this is from Google on MLAP's technical capabilities. Um, and there's two parts to this. You have foundational capabilities that are really part of any uh, IT system where you need infrastructure, security, uh, and privacy, and uh, artifact repositories. And on top of that, you have your MLOps capabilities. Um, kind of starting with these two gray boxes, you want a artifact and metadata repository to do things like, you know, track data source versioning, model versioning, hyperparameters that you're using, uh, model, uh, um, uh, model tracking. And on top of that, like I mentioned, you probably want a feature store to be able to share uh, the features that you create across your organization to speed up creating new models. And in between that, you see all these different uh, capabilities that you can have. Um, what's important is, you know, it's important to remember you don't need every capability here. Um, what you need kind of depends on your organization and the types of models that you're serving. And you don't necessarily want to go out there and build a system that has all this stuff right off the bat. Um, it'll take a long time. You'll probably uh, design your system incorrectly, but you want to take more of an iterative approach where you start pretty small with a couple of these and keep adding functionality iteratively. And just to illustrate what a, a pipeline can look like for those who haven't seen it, uh, here's just a, a sample architecture where you have uh, multiple data sources, like I talked about, and you'll probably be doing your ETL transformation. Um, in this case, we're doing it inside of a feature store. Uh, once you have your features, you, you can store them in that said feature store. And if we move over to orchestration, we pull the data out of there. Maybe we're pulling a multiple feature set. We need to do some data preparation and merge all of those features together into our final data set. We can train it, train our model, we do an evaluation. Um, if the model is performing better than what we have in production, we will deploy it. And when we deploy it, we can do it in multiple uh, ways, depending on, on the needs of um, whoever's consuming the model, whether it's online API endpoints, batch, or streaming inference jobs. And we'll probably do monitoring um, of that model as well. If uh, we don't promote it, if it doesn't perform better than what we have in production, 
we'll archive it, we'll analyze it, we'll retrain the model with uh, new hyperparameters and try to uh, get better performance out of it and kind of go through that, that training loop once again. So this is just an illustration. Not all pipelines look like this. It, it depends on, on the, the needs of your organization. But I think this is just a, a good mental model to have in the back of your mind as we go through this talk. Okay, I'm gonna grab a drink here. Let's move on to the second part, interesting things about HelloFresh. So HelloFresh is a meal kit company. We, uh, I like to think of us as a combination of Spotify mixed with Amazon and that we are a subscription-based company. But on the other hand, we have these giant warehouses where we create our products and we ship these boxes off all over the world. Um, we are the largest meal kit company in the world. Uh, seven out of 10 meal kits is a HelloFresh meal kit. And our mission is to change the way that people eat forever. And the way that we do that is really through these four dimensions. We have cost-effective meals. Um, the majority of them are, are fairly healthy. Uh, they taste quite great. We have a good quality product and uh, we are more sustainable than the conventional, uh, go to the grocery store and buy your groceries and bring them home. And the way that we do that is that traditionally, this is what your food supply chain looks like. Uh, you'll have many middlemen here, wholesalers, warehouses, and supermarkets before the food finally reaches your plate. We get rid of all of those middlemen. We source all of our, our food directly from the producer, direct to our warehouses. We put these meal kits together and we deliver them directly to you. Um, and that results in more freshness. You can get your food faster and we have less waste in our, uh, in our supply chain compared to the traditional uh, supply chain. So that's kind of the, the secret sauce behind what we do. <clears throat> Some um, interesting statistics here. Um, we have 8 million active customers worldwide in 2022. Almost 67 million meals uh, delivered. We're operating in 18 countries. Uh, we're gonna be 19 hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, almost 600 million orders placed this year. And here you can see our, our headcount growth um, in the past, uh, you know, almost 10 years. You can really see that it's taken off exponentially from around 2017. It's really uh, taken off. And that's part of our, our MLOps story that I'm gonna be telling uh, in just a bit. Real quick, where we operate, we're in North America um, and Western Europe, as well as Australia and New Zealand and uh, Japan. And we're trying to expand to Spain by the end of the year. And I think we actually just expanded to Ireland. Uh, so that one should be penciled in as well. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what our, our tech organization looks like, because that plays into our MLOps story, of course. So let me give you a quick snapshot of how we're, we're structured on the tech side. Um, you can basically divide up our our uh, our tech department called Flow Tech into five areas, growth marketing, uh, product assortment, foundations and technology, operations, and finance and analytics. Uh, I sit on a team called Global AI. Uh, it's um, within this group called Decisions. So these are all alliances and we're using the Spotify model. So we have alliances, underneath alliances, we have different tribes. And within the tribes, we have different squads, which is just our scrum uh, delivery team. Uh, but my my uh, team sits here. We're the largest um, uh, data science group at the company. But then we have all these different data science teams and these uh, different alliances. We have teams within data, within uh, food, uh, within growth, uh, within operations. And if you oversimplify the structure of the organization, uh, you can break the data science teams into really two different buckets, I think. We have marketing type data science teams that work on marketing applications. And then we have supply chain and operations type teams that work on that side of the house. And then you can also slice the teams between North America and international. Uh, I should also mention that you know, we are a uh, German founded company. The company's based out of Berlin. So um, a big part of our staff sits there, the, the larger part and um, the other half is kind of here in North America. And there's some exceptions to that, of course. Um, 
But above all of this uh, is my team, kind of this overarching team, Global AI. And to oversimplify what we do, I would call ourselves a platform team. We have different types of platforms that we build. Uh, one of them is the MLApps platform, but we also have models that we, we build as well. But to simplify this conversation, we'll call ourselves a platform team. And our goal is to really enable other teams throughout the organization to help them build models faster. All right, so let's talk about our, our data science journey as a, a company. So uh, once again, bringing back our headcount chart here, um, like I mentioned, we had really ex uh, explosive growth here from about 2017, and things really took off during the pandemic for us. A lot of people became really interested in cooking and, and wanting to learn how to cook. Uh, so we were really um, spending a lot of our time opening up new distribution centers to accommodate for that growth. Uh, and what happened was we started having more and more data science teams grow throughout our organization. These data science teams, um, they didn't have the best of communication with each other. Uh, sometimes we had a little bit of overlapping um, scope between teams. Uh, there wasn't great communication when it came to tooling. People developed their, their tooling uh, pretty independently of each other. Um, no teams really had uh, mature end-to-end -end pipelines. Uh, and this resulted in a lot of problems for the teams. So some of the issues that we saw was, uh, like I mentioned, we had inconsistent tooling. We didn't have company-wide standards. Uh, but on the data science side, we had scaling difficulties, especially when we were trying to get our models uh, across different geographies. Um, we had reliability issues with our data pipelines and ETL, and we accumulated a lot of tech debt. Um, I think one of the reasons for this is partially the... the the organizational model that we have chosen, the Spotify model. Uh, it's in, you know, the whole point of the model is, is that you have autonomous teams and you want them to move fast. And that's awesome and great. And I believe in it. But on the other side of the coin, you, you develop a lot of these problems. And at some point as an organization, you have to take a step back and decide to, to deal with them. And I think we're at that point right now where I'd say that we're kind of going through our awkward teenage years as a uh, data science organization. And we're trying to go from, you know, we have some pretty good stuff today, but we want to be a world-class machine learning organization. And a lot of the tools and platforms that we're building today is going to, are going to help our teams get there. Okay. So that was HelloFresh. And now we're going to talk about we're going to combine those two things, and we're going to talk about MLOps at HelloFresh. So let's dive into it. So how did we approach building our MLOps platform? Well, uh, it really took a, a similar approach to any engineering problem or, or the way any product manager would look at this problem. Uh, it's all about understanding the problem space first. Uh, so the first thing we, we have to do is really understand our, our customers and what are the, their pain points and what are their needs. We have to define a product vision. Um, we have to talk about what we want to create. We want to talk about what we don't want to create as well. And once we have uh, created those two things, we can go into the solution space. We can get into things like the tool selection, um, figuring out what our platform is going to be built on, and then get into the development phase. One of the problems that I see tech teams do is that sometimes if, if they're just engineering led, you'll often see teams just jump to points three and four and just dive into tool selection and development. And you might get into a situ situation where you try to create the Swiss army knife and try to handle every possible hypothetical situation that you think might arise, but you don't really understand the problems that you need to solve very well. So you'll over-engineer, you'll, you'll uh, spend a lot of time and ultimately not solve the problem that your users are facing. So the, the most important part is really to spend enough time on the first two points. And uh, we actually spent a lot of time here, many months just to understand and to define what we wanted to create. Uh, and if you're looking to build a platform, I would advise you to, to do the same, spend a lot of time on, on this space before you start uh, building something. So I'm gonna talk about those four points and kind of many subsections here and kind of go into details about how did we approach each one uh, and give you some frameworks and some tips uh, in each section. So how did we understand our users? So pulling back our little uh, org illustration here, um, 
we ask kind of the obvious questions that, that you would think that we would ask, uh, first of all. Uh, when I started back in at the beginning of the year here, um, we didn't really have a good understanding as an organization of what all the data science teams were and what they were working on. There were pockets of knowledge that understood parts of organizations, uh, but there wasn't that kind of top level understanding of even what everyone was doing. So we really had to just ask, you know, who, who are the data science teams and what problems are they working on and just go around and talk to them uh, to get and, and kind of map that out. And that sounds like a very trivial thing, but when you're, you're in a large organization with uh, a thousand people in your tech organization, that actually took takes quite a bit of while to, to map out the space and, and learn where everybody is and what they're working on. The third thing that we asked is we wanted to map out what model architectures and what data they're using in their models. We want to understand what kind of tooling they're using today. What do they like? What do they not like with their existing tooling? What problems do they have? And then we also had to understand, you know, what are the, the data roles within the company and uh, what's our definition for them and who should we be building the system for? Uh, once again, it also sounds like kind of a almost silly question, but once again, in large organizations, um, you know, and especially being a company that operates in Europe and the U.S., it's easy to have different definitions for different types of roles across a across a uh, org organization. Um, so I'm going to go through each of these in the next couple of slides and kind of show you how we approached each of these problems, starting with uh, the bottom one here. So we mapped out different roles across our organization, and I think. An industry-wide problem that you, we have in, in machine learning is that, let's say you know, let's say you're a product data scientist at, at HelloFresh, but you go to a different company. Um, product data scientists might need something different there, and you might have different job responsibilities. And I think you see that pretty commonly across the board here for all of these roles. So we have a kind of a standardization of of job description problem, I think, in the machine learning uh, industry uh, that hopefully will will get better over time. But what we did was we, we drew out this axis here, um, starting with less technical roles on the left. And as you advance to the right, you, you get into more technical roles. And we created these, oops, excuse me, we created these definitions for the different roles. And we said that, well, we want to build a platform for our data scientists and ML engineers. And in the HelloFresh world, that means uh, a data scientist is somebody who, who builds and creates the models. And the ML engineer is somebody who takes those models and productionalizes them. The hopefully this is not in the way. Uh, is, is can everybody see the the slide or is this little thing blocking it? There, let me see if I can get it off the screen. There we go. Um, the next thing we wanted to do is to map up the maturity of the existing MLOps in our our company. And what we did was we went around and talked to teams, of course, of what their pipelines looked like, but then we wanted to visualize it. So we created this little framework where we uh, plotted several models across our X axis up here. We plotted the major components from a MLOP system on our Y axis over here. And we also came off with definitions for, you know, what does it mean to be mature in, in each of these components? And by doing that, we, then we could score each model um, either as immature, intermediate, or mature and create this heat map of, of, of what was going on across our organization. And uh, a couple of things pop out, right? Um, we noticed that we're definitely weaker on the back half of our pipeline from ML deployment to drift detection. Um, we, also, <clears throat> we also noticed that you know, no one uh, really has model optimization uh, or distributed hyperparameter tuning. Um, no one's really doing that today so we decided that, okay, that, that's a nice to have, but maybe that's a secondary problem that we'll address later. Let's focus a lot of our effort um, on this part right now from ML deployment to drift detection. Um, and we also noticed that we're not really fully mature in, in any of these areas. Um, I think that really popped out as well. The next thing that we wanted to do was to understand um, the types of models that we had in our organization. So creating a similar plot, you you lay out your models here on the x-axis. Then we looked at things like ML orchestration and ML architecture for those models. Um, so starting at the top, we laid out the, the data structure. We noticed that most of our models are, are using tabular data. 
Um, we looked at things like retraining cadence, the inference cadence and the deployment types for these different models, started seeing patterns there. Um, and then we looked at the ML architecture. So the model type, uh, we do a lot of boosted trees in our organization. Um, we looked at the target and we looked at the complexity as well. And what the spot does, it, it really helps you later on when you get into the tool selection phase to look at tools that can support these types of models. Um, so it really kind of helps you once you get to that step to make good decisions uh, for tool selection. Um, the third thing that we did was to look at the different tools across teams that the, and what tooling they're using. A similar plot again, model on, on the x-axis. We have our 10 categories for our MLOps pipeline on the right. And what you do is just plot out the different tools that people are using. Now, this plot looks pretty stupid because I've had to uh, white label uh, the, the, the chart and not show the different tools that the teams were using. Um, but you get the idea if you take this and you color code it, you'll start seeing patterns. And it'll give you a good indication for what tools should you probably consider keeping uh, versus which ones maybe you should you know, uh, consider replacing, which ones are one-off tools. Uh, so we'll just kind of create that, that visualization for you, uh, which is very helpful, helpful when you have a large organization and many mo models to consider. Then the next thing that we did was to look at ourselves in a ML maturity framework. Uh, so just kind of a self-assessment of where are we today? And when we started this journey uh, early this year, we were somewhere, we're probably at the beginning of one here of uh, DevOps, but no ML ops. And this framework comes from Microsoft. You can find it at this link down here. Um, and right now we've, we're, we're basically launching our ML platform. I think we'll get most of our models on there by next summer. Um, and we expect to be all the way up to level four by then. Um, but the idea is that you can continuously kind of come back to this, frame, this framework and assess where you're at and make sure that you're making good progress towards uh, being a mature ML ops company. And then another helpful, helpful thing that we did early on was to identify different uh, sample models and sample use cases that we could use during the development phase. Um, and the reason I think why this is very helpful to do upfront is um, if you don't do it, uh, you'll probably spend a lot of time searching for representative models once you get to that uh, development phase, or you'll come up with um, a model that you think is a good representation of what your company does but it, it, maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's just a Mickey Mouse model that doesn't actually reflect what, what you guys re really do as a company. So I think it's good to pick out a couple different style of models and have those in your back pocket. All right, let's talk about uh, defining the vision for the platform. So this is the model maturity framework that we came up with. Um, here you'll see these 10 different MLOps categories that you saw on those heat charts a couple slides ago. And this is basically the input, what we used for assessing how mature um, each model was at, for each component of the pipeline. Um, I think the, these questions are a combination of frameworks provided by Microsoft and AWS that we used as inspiration for this. Um, but the right questions for, for each component will really depend on what your organization needs. So this isn't, I wouldn't use it as a source of truth, um, but it's a good starting point. Um, just to illustrate like some of the questions that we were asking for, let's take feature engineering, for example. Um, so for us to be a mature company in terms of feature engineering, we want ETL pipelines that are automated. Pipelines should be version controlled. Feature preparation should occur in a feature store. Feature, feature services are registered in the, in the feature store and model features are pulled from the feature store. So that's just an example. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I think uh, this is basically what you wanna create. So you have a source of truth to kind of go back to and, um, and benchmark against just so you know that you're mature in each category. The next thing that we made was a uh, MLAPS platform vision. So our vision was to create an end-to-end -end tool that would automate the MLOps pipeline creation process and speed up the productionalization of models by standardizing MLOps across HelloFresh for the majority of our machine learning models. 
I think the important part here is actually this, these last couple of words for the majority of our machine learning models. So we're acknowledging that we're not going to be able to create a system that's going to work for every single model that we could possibly create as an organization, but we want to focus on the majority of them. And this kind of implies that we, we need more than one product, right? Um, this led us to, to adopt the 80-20 rule where we said that, okay, we think that we can automate 80% of the models uh, within our, our company. Um, the 20% that we can't automate, those should be very easy to create um, using a different tool. So fully automated 80%, easy to create for the other 20%. And that led us to do what our product stack should look like. So here's a visualization of our, our product offering. And I, I think I'll start here at the bottom and work my way up. So at the bottom, we have our service layer. These are the, the main components for the, the ML ops pipeline, a registry, a feature store, uh, orchestration, inference endpoints, and monitoring. On top of that, we have an integration layer. Um, this basically just enables you to communicate from our, our uh, products down to the individual tools that we're using and, and configure them uh, however you want. On top of that, we have uh, two different products that we're offering. Uh, the first is called Spice Rack, and it's a low-level API that's designed for our MLOps engineers. The MLOps engineers, they, what they really care about is configurability. They want to be able to go in here and um, tweak every MLOps uh, tool that we have provided, but we also want to make their lives faster and simpler, right? And the way we do that is by treating Spice Rack as really a, a wrapper that goes around all these different tools that we are using. And rather than learning, um, you know, let's say, rather than learning uh, many different services, you know, five, six, seven different tools, you'll just have to learn the API classes for, uh, for one tool. The other benefit that it uh, adds is that we can really speed up um, the time it takes to create a pipeline. And the way we do that is by providing templates for popular uh, pipeline architectures that occur across our organization. So, so the really the combination of having that uh, wrapper around uh, other tools that simplifies the use of those tools and the use of templates that's going to accelerate development across the organization. So that's for our, our most technical persona, the MLOps engineer. Then on top of that, we have another tool called, uh, or another product called MLOps Factory. And this is a high level API uh, designed for data scientists. And data scientists, they, you know, they don't necessarily care as much about being able to configure every single component. Um, they do want a pipeline, but they want to move quickly. And the idea here is that we'll create a product where if you meet a certain spe set of input specifications with your model, then this API will build out a full end-to-end -end, um, MLOps pipeline for you. You won't be able to configure that pipeline or you'll have very limited ability to, to configure it. But the trade-off there is that, you know, maybe you'll be able to spin up the infrastructure for this pipeline in 10, 15 minutes. Um, today, it takes our, our engineers about four weeks to build out a pipeline. That's not even a full end-to-end -end pipeline uh, like the ones that I showed you in, in that introductory section for, for MLOps. Uh, but that's just a pipeline that has certain parts of, of those components that I showed. Um, and with Spice Rack, we think that we can get uh, the time to build a pipeline down to less than a day. And we're hoping with MLOps, like I said, I think under 15 minutes is the goal just to spin up the infrastructure once you meet those uh, input specifications. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it, taking a uh, multi-API tiered approach to address different customers with, with different user needs. And here's just an illustration of, of how Spice Rack is solving some of these problems that we called out earlier of inconsistent tooling, lack of standards, scaling problems, reliability, and tech debt. Um, the benefits of the platform, it is going to accelerate um, ML model uh, deployment and development. It's also going to be more reliable in terms of your ETLs and pipelines. It's going to have scalable infrastructure. It's going to be easy to use, and it will standardize the ML infrastructure across the organization. So it really addresses a lot of our, our pain points as a company. Okay, 
So that was uh, the vision for what we wanted to create. Now let's talk about how do we choose the tools that are going to enable this vision. So there are uh, a couple of pain points when choosing tooling within ML Ops. Um, there are a lot of services out there. Last week, I read an article. I think there's about nearly 100 companies in the ML Ops space right now. Some of those companies cover end-to-end -end pipelines. Some of them cover just one component of the pipeline. Some of them cover a couple different components. Um, and it's just really confusing to understand who does what right now. And it seems like new com companies are popping up every month. Um, so we have that very confusing tool selection. There are many options out there. And the third thing that's complicated is it's, it's really hard to understand how these tools integrate with each other. It's not just what do the tools do, but how, how well do they work together? And I think what, what I'm seeing is that a lot of companies claim that, it, oh, our tool is really easy to use and it's easy to integrate with this or that. But I think a lot of companies are over-promising right now in terms of how well things integrate and how easy it is uh, to do that integration is, is what I've found. So what I'm seeing is you don't really know um, what you're getting until you take a tool and you try to integrate it with something to find out really how well it works. Uh, and when doing tool selection, you can really, it's easy to get lost in the weeds. And uh, I see that someone's raised their hand. I'll, Write your question down. I'll, I'll take the questions at the end here, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it's good to set up a, a set of principles uh, when doing tool selection. Uh, it gets pretty confusing when you start getting into it, and you, it's easy to get lost in, in the weeds and the details. So our team came up with this uh, set of six principles that, that guided our decision making. We chose, we wanted to have open source tools over closed source. We wanted to use APIs over um, GUIs or graphical user interfaces. We wanted lightweight APIs over integrated tools to avoid vendor lock-in. Uh, fewer tools were considered uh, better. Um, a little asterisk to that, we just didn't want one end-to-end -end tool because we didn't want to be locked into one technology. But at the other end of the spectrum, we don't want 10 tools either. So we want something in the middle that, you know, find that sweet spot between one and, and 10, right? Um, we acknowledge that we want to build a system that's practical and get it to market quickly over something that's perfect. We don't think that we can ever, ever get to perfect. Uh, we acknowledge that. So we want to move quickly and just get something out there that people can use and keep iterating on that. And then um, Python is really important to us. Uh, we are a uh, Python organization uh, and, and all tools have to have that as the common denominator. So there were two different ways that we chose tools, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share both of those ways. The first tool that we chose was our feature store, and, and that's really the backbone to our entire MLOP system and, and a very important component. And we wanted to take a very scientific approach to selecting this tool. Uh, so we went through these four different steps. The first one was to identify the needs uh, for that feature store. The way we did that was to have an agile session with a couple different data science teams. Um, they would write down uh, questions and do kind of a mind map for, you know, what do they think are important questions to uh, consider um, for a feature store or what are important technical needs. Then we would kind of mind map and cluster those ideas together and rewrite them as questions. We grouped those questions into different categories. Um, categories were things like, you know, tech questions, uh, security, cost, user experience, short and long term strategic considerations. And then we would prioritize those questions as low, medium, or high. And those are really weights. Because ultimately what we're doing is uh, we did an evaluation. We had narrowed down the field to three different vendors. Then we did a technical evaluation on those platforms, uh, scored them quantitatively uh, when possible. Sometimes we did qualitative evaluations, especially on things like user experience, where you're really comparing between two different platforms, how easy it's to do something. But ultimately, we ended up with numeric scores for everything. We weighted them with uh, the priority, and we came up with the total max score that we could compare the different services um, to. And the output uh, looks like this, where you have the three different vendors. Um, ultimately, we chose a vendor called Tecton, and uh, you can see the max score down here and what percentage they got. And uh, here's a, just kind of a visualization of some of the, the key features of the platforms. 
But what, what's really good with this approach is that it's very scientific, it's very structured, it's easy to communicate to your C level, uh, how you went about testing the platforms and, and why one is better than the other. And it really removes that personal bias. And I, I've found, I've been involved in a couple different platform selection engagements as a consultant. And I found that there's a lot of personal bias that goes into these decisions, depending on what people have used in the past and where people are coming from. And we're trying to get rid of all that bias and just um, uh, select the tool based on its merit. Now, <clears throat> The downside with uh, this, this method is that it does take up a lot of time. Uh, it's a very rigorous method and, and thorough, but it takes up time. So that's kind of the trade-off. So we want to ask the question, well, we have to make a lot of tooling decisions. And how do we scale this process to make all the tooling decisions that we have to make? If, if we spend this much time, we'll spend two, three years uh, just deciding on what tooling to use without even building anything. So how do we move faster? Well. To move faster, first we had to understand what the MLOps industry landscape looks like. Uh, and we had one of our engineers do a very thorough mapping where he looked at about 60 different companies and grouped them into uh, these different categories that they operate. In. And once again, did just a visual uh, heat map of, of where they operate and what they're good at. And that helped us narrow the field down to 12 to 15 different vendors that we would look at very seriously. And Rather than doing a one-by-one -one evaluation, we thought, let's uh, do a hackathon and evaluate many different services at the same time. Because once again, it's, it's not just about the tool itself, but it's really about how do the tools integrate with each other. Uh, and you want to find that secret, you know, that, that's a special sauce combination uh, that's just right and that works for your organization. So we took uh, two levels to this. One was the, the integration analysis. Uh, we built these five different stacks with different uh, tools and services and mapped them you know, across what, what parts of the pipeline do they cover. Um, from this evaluation, we basically figured out which uh, vendors we should contact, which tools do we want to move on to the next round and evaluate hands-on, and which ones should we deprioritize and, and not consider. Then in the second round, uh, we evaluated uh, different uh, pipelines here. Uh, we created five different pipelines. I've, uh, I've removed the, the labels here. I'm not sure what we were doing, but uh, basically, like I said, what we were looking for is that integration and how well the tools worked at the same time. And the way this worked is you you would build a couple of pipelines and you, you figure out, oh, I, I like these tools for the first part of my pipeline. I like those tools for the, the back half. And then in the next round, let's combine those two and try that out. And then you're like, you learn a couple of new things. And you're like, okay, that worked out pretty good, but let's swap this service out for the next one. And you do another round of testing. And after a couple of rounds of, of experimentation like that, you ultimately end up with a pipeline that, that works pretty good, that you're happy with, and that can be kind of your MVP pipeline that you can start with. Um, so it was a faster way to move. Um, it's still fairly scientific, but, but there, there is a trade-off there that you are not quite as thorough as the other technique. Um, just a couple points here for uh, doing tool selection. Once again, define your guiding principles early. It's your roadmap. When you get into the actual hackathon or the evaluation, it's super easy to get lost. So it's very nice to have those, those principles to fall back to. Everybody has an opinion, uh, and especially data scientists. And I realize that I'm talking to probably many data scientists right now. But uh, data scientists are very opinionated and have a strong belief in which tools are better and which ones are worse. Um, to get around that, uh, we did two things. We used a small team to evaluate these different tools. And we did this in stealth mode once we had gotten inputs from the other teams, um, just to be able to move quickly and, and make decisions quickly. I'm a strong believer that, that tool selection is not a democratic process. You collect your inputs, you figure out what, what you need to do, then you go evaluate things and you make decisions quickly. Um, and when doing that, you wanna take that scientific process to remove bias. <clears throat> and you also wanna time box your approach because you can, you can spend forever on this, right? So define what's a reasonable amount of time to evaluate tools, uh, depending on how many you're gonna look at, draw a line in the sand, do as much work as you can within that period and then make a decision and move on. All right, last section here, uh, development. 
So um, we came up with a couple of different design principles when we headed into the development phase. <clears throat> we, we don't want to be locked into one tool. And the idea here is that this MLS industry is evolving so quickly, so many new companies all the time. There are going to be better tools that come al along, maybe in six months, maybe next year. But we don't want to be locked into one tool and not be able to get out of it. So we want to build a system where the user doesn't really see what's under the hood. They shouldn't care. They just interact with um, the, the product that we're creating, the platform that we're creating, and we can swap uh, the components in and out. And the only difference that they should see is, is better performance. They shouldn't see a difference in the API classes that we're, we're creating. We also want to have very simple and intuitive API classes, not uh, a lot of weird language, which we tend to have in, in, in the MLOps world. And you shouldn't have to be, start from scratch every time. We want to work from templates as much as possible. Um, and the user experience uh, looks like this for, for Spice Rack. Um, think of it as, uh, you know, it's an API wrapper, but it really works more like, like a Python library, like scikit-learn, that you pip install the library at the beginning of your, of your notebook. Um, you can either call up the different uh, classes that we've created, but the more likely scenario is that you'll you'll go to GitHub and you'll download load one of the templates that we've created for popular pipeline architectures at, at HelloFresh. They're pre-populated. You just go in there and, and tweak a couple things to make sure that you're pulling data from the right data set. You're using the right model architecture, you set in your evaluation metrics and so on. Once you've done all that, you, you run it and you build your pipeline. And uh, it should be pretty fast to, to move on this platform. It consists of these five major components. We have uh, what we call the experiment manager. It's really uh, like an artifact management tool of um, uh, tracking and storing, you know, uh, data sets, features, models, uh, hyperparameters, all that kind of good stuff. And then it's also a promoter in there where it will take your model, it will come, it will uh, compare it to a a golden data set. It'll see how it performs compared to the existing model in production and decide if it should promote it to production or not. Then we have two deployment components, our, our batch predictor, which is our, our batch, uh, batch tool. Then we have our rest and deployer. And then we have a monitoring component and a drift detector. And this is kind of the point in the presentation where I would pull out a fancy video and show you an awesome demo of, of this in action. I do have that video, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to show it. So in, uh, in lieu of that, I'm going to kind of talk through some of the key steps of, of using the platform at, at a high level, just to give you a sense for uh, what a, a ML engineer would actually do. So uh, the platform, uh, it assumes that you have ingested your model features into this feature store. So the first thing that you need to do is configure your data sets to pull the data from the feature store. Uh, the second thing you do is set up the, your model configuration. So what, you know, what type of model architecture are you using? Thirdly, you would configure your experiment tracking so that artifact management and uh, kind of the, the rules for the model promotion uh, and the data set for the model promotion. Then we would select the deployment type. Is it a batch or is it a REST endpoint? Um, we would configure the backend after that. We offer different types of different compute uh, resources for, for different situations. Uh, you'll set up your orchestration after that using our pipeline orchestration tool. And then we kind of sandwich that all together in what we call the model specification. And it's really just the instruction set that calls out these, these six different lines to tie everything together in, in one nice tight little instruction set. And if we just visualize this, this is what it looks like, that you, you create this model spec with those six different steps. We read your data set and pull the data from the feature store, train and validate our model, we decide if we should promote, promote it or not, we deploy it either by REST endpoint or our batch score, and then we do our, um, our model reporting or our model monitoring uh, to report performance or drift. Okay, we're almost there. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, I said this early on, but your MEP doesn't need everything, right? Uh, these are the 10 things that we want to do, but it's not what we are launching in our first version. 
Uh, we're not doing model optimization off the bat. We're also not doing drift detection off the bat. What, what you need to do when you design a platform is figure out <clears throat> how do I build a system that adds enough incremental value to where my autonomous data science teams will want to use it, where they, they get excited about the product and they, they see the value in it and it solves a problem for them. Um, that line in the sand, it, it'll depend on where the data science teams are, what problems they have, and you'll, you'll have to figure that out through you know, your interviews with the different data science teams, what makes sense for your organization. But what, what doesn't make sense is to try to do everything in one swoop and it'll come out bad that way. Uh, real quick on our testing release strategy, uh, pretty standard stuff. We've just launched our, our beta version for Spice Rack. We're testing it with a handful of internal teams right now on beta use cases. We're collecting feedback from them. That feedback is driving our roadmap for the coming quarters. It also um, is input to the templates that we want to create for, for all the data science teams. Uh, so that's a great way to, to develop templates is work closely on, with teams on specific use cases that are very common for those teams. Um, and, and after a while, after you're working with several teams, you'll have a nice little library of templates that people can choose from. Okay, I think this is my last slide. So just a couple of uh, points of advice uh, when heading out the door here. So uh, I know I've talked about this a lot, but I'm gonna keep hitting uh, uh, the, the nail on the head here that uh, don't try to build the Swiss army knife, a build for a specific use case with a team or within a specific vertical. Um, it's not good to build generically because you'll probably build a lot of stuff that's not needed or it'll become very expensive to, to build something. Um, find use cases that are representative of what your company does to develop pipeline templates that will really help accelerate your, your team. Don't overbuild or make your MVP too complicated. We want to start small. We want to keep building iteratively. Under, uh, I didn't talk about, about this too much in the introduction, um, but you really want to understand the model lifecycle, the ML model li lifecycle, and how your users are, are working and understand you know, how, at what point do they start using your platform and their development life cycle. Um, I think that's a very important thing to understand. Consider our multi-API approach with high and low level APIs for different users and different needs. It's hard to build something that's gonna work for everyone. And one way to get around that is to kind of slice the pie. Uh, and and uh, sometimes you can do more than just two. Uh, sometimes three might be appropriate, but to identify the, the major user groups and uh, address their needs with a, a custom API for them. Uh, make a, a, a strong communication plan. So <laughs> even though these are internal products and platforms, uh, you're, still, you're still selling this thing. And it's really hard to uh, force people to adopt a platform. Um, you have to build something that solves a problem for them that they get excited about, and then you have to keep communicating that value over time and just keep them engaged up on what you're working on. And one of the ways that we're doing that uh, at Loho Fresh is we're, we're creating a MLOps council. And the idea here is that we'll have different representatives from different data science teams across the organization, um, both on the tech side and the product side. And it's kind of a two-way communication channel, right? So we'll inform them of what are the latest and greatest things that we're working on from our side. Uh, and then from their side, they'll inform us of what are the new models that they're working on and what are some of the, the, the new templates that they would like to see in the future. So uh, it'll help drive our roadmap as well. But I think that's a, a good communication channel um, in addition to kind of the one-on-one -on -one engagement with different data science teams across an organization. And if you want to learn more about building platforms, um, there's a great article called What I Learned uh, Building Platforms at Stitch Fit, Stitch Fix by uh, Stefan Krokic. Um, very interesting article that hits on many of the uh, similar topics that I've talked about tonight, but it's uh, a, kind of a great strategic re read if you want to learn more about um, AI product leadership and building these, these platforms. So uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So we do have some questions in the question and answer. Um, 
could also unmute Michael Lane. I'll, I'll let you moderate the questions and we'll try to answer them as best I can. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have one towards the end. Uh, can you talk about the system tests that you did use to ensure the models are working properly? Um, we are, so we're rolling out beta right now, but we are incorporating some BDD testing um, is, is the plan. Um, but we're actually gonna do more and more of that uh, in future releases. Um, we are a little bit light in that area right now, but we're more interesting to, to kind of just get the tool out there and get people using it before we, we uh, have tons of automated testing uh, in our, our uh, 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 pipeline creation process. And then I just, um, I unmuted Michael Lane because he was, you asked a few questions. So if you want to unmute, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess the, I'm realizing from this talk that you can't be very specific probably because of an NBA, I would assume. Yeah, I, exactly. I can't, can't give away the secret sauce, but um, I can talk. Yeah. And, and we do model ops for like, the courts over here, over here in Atlanta. So we can't be specific either, but we can talk about like little general things. So I understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have resources that you would recommend for people who are starting in this to learn the principles that you've been talking about on a more specific yeah. basis? Yes, I actually have a slide for that that I had to skip uh, due to time constraints, but I'll pull it up here. Um, here, let's let me blow this up. And, and that will basically summarize all the other questions that I asked. Yeah, um, I, I kind of mentioned this very quickly on the intro, but there are many good resources from you know big cloud providers, GCP, AWS, and Azure. Um, everyone's you know trying to sell their services, obviously through these white papers, but you know, most platforms have the same or very similar type tools. So if you just abstract away the, the tool names and focus more on the principles that they're talking about, I think, uh, you know, you can Google these, these uh, three titles right here and you'll find some good stuff. This GCP one is very good. It's pretty in depth, uh, pretty heavy, but, um, but, but a good resource. What, what I find is available out there, there, there's a lot of technical learning about, um, you know, about ML ops, but there actually aren't that many uh, information sources about what I talked about tonight about, you know, the really the product management of it and uh, strategic decision making around uh, how do you build these systems. Correct. Uh, th that's not very well documented. So I only know one vendor who actually does it and they do like a community meetup. So yeah, correct. Yep. But uh, I think another good resource is that last article that I pointed to as well, uh, the Stitch Fix article. I can pull it up here again. What I learned building platforms at Stitch Fix, if you Google that, um, it's a pretty long, long article, but it's a good read. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Okay, well, um, yeah, I guess if any, no one else has other questions, thank you so much, Dr. Whitman. That was a really exciting talk. And again, we'll have the link to the YouTube video out on our page and keep an eye out for our next, next month's meeting around the end of the month, the last Thursday in the month. And yeah, have a good night. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, um... I'm going to co-publish an article. It'll probably be out next week with um, our feature store partner, Tecton. Um, I'll be publishing that on, on LinkedIn. It'll be up on their, their website as well. Um, and there'll be a more detailed article about just how we went through that feature store uh, selection process uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Cool. Thank All you right. so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.